is it, it yeah. Dry? No, it's dry. It is. I, I tone a lot of my canvases ahead of time. I just have lots of them toned at home, and I just bring a, a bunch of them decide which one I want to use when I get there. So I, I like to just have that dry. These are some of the other um, different colored canvas tones I might put on my... Yeah. So... You never know how the colors are sometimes going to affect your landscape. And I always kind of like the surprises that, that happen with them. Having these different little peaks of color pop through. And um, you just, uh, yeah, just kind of surprises you so you don't always know what, every, what it's going to be looking like. Is yeah. there any color that you recommend for using on like under very green, green landscape? I say any. Try anything. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that's, I mean, that's what people generally will start with when you do red. How many years can you do red? Then you got to start doing something else. So you can use burnt sienna, you know, your cad red. If you do something like a cad red, you need to do it ahead so it's dry. Mm -hmm. Burnt sienna you can do on the spot because it just mixes in with everything you're doing and neutralizes. But it then it doesn't have any effect, particularly in like a pocket of color popping through because it's wet um, but yeah try you know mix it up try different things because it's really it's good for you to experiment and um, not getting just a, doing one thing all the time Know, darker tones behind this bridge and back beyond it under it and so you got to have enough neutral colors back there um, so that the bright lights will show up and it'll feel like you got some distance underneath just I'm pushing in what's on my brush just like cleaning it off basically and getting a darker sort of neutral value that neutral come on over here. So this is going to have more color. This will, I don't have to worry about this. Most of the things that change so much is in this area. So I want to kind of focus on that. So I want to, I think I'm going to um, get a little bit of the bridge going, this front bridge. to keep me on track. I'm gonna so I get a little bit of heavier color.
little edging. dimension to the underside of the bridge. Dark. Then we know where to put the lights under that. like this with the bridge that's got all these colors coming through it and um, interruptions with I don't know what those boards are and some of the, uh, the seating areas or whatever you don't have to do all of that stuff you know if you try to put it all in it's going to be so busy and it gets really complicated People, you don't know it doesn't, doesn't always read well so you just you can be very selective what you put in you can leave it all out if it reads better it's just simpler you know, it's your job to do a lot of editing, so um, the painting reads as clear as it can. You almost um, use this light to space between the post there under there. And even the posts are all different colors. I mean, some are really dark, some are, are not so dark. So you want to mix it up because that's kind of cool. And you don't get everything looking the same underneath there. Then we have structures. It'll take a little more time. painted out here before? Mm -hmm. Inside the zoo is so nice too. So many beautiful gardens. I like this other little piece of grassy land. Well, reflections are kind of like clouds and like, like everything crazy that's moving all the time. And so
So you can get down one thing in the beginning that you see. And then, you know, in five minutes, how it's changing. But you, you have, and you can change it a couple times, but you have to finally let go of it. And um, you just have to look at your painting and reorganize those shapes. Because if you have a spot of light here and a spot of light there and a pink here and a blue there, I mean, it's it gets crazy. So you have to organize it. And you have to really look at your painting more than what's out there at a certain point. As you fight it and fight it too much. So it's really important that you, when you're out here, you, can, you have to study your painting almost as much as the landscape. I'm just going um, going back up a little, a little bit because we want to get a little bit more darks established at the top. So use your oranges and use your raw sienna, all your yellows, variations of yellows, all your different blues, as well as like your sap greens, and um, to get the variations you need in these this greenery. People have a hard time mixing and getting enough of the flavors, but you gotta be sure you're using all your colors. Have a full palette out and really use them. You want to be sure that you're getting sort of the feeling of the day that you're after. So sometimes, too, when you're so focused, you do actually you lose track of that. You have to be stepping back a lot, looking at your overall painting because you're always adjusting, and then you kind of lose track of what you're really, what kind of feeling your whole painting is getting. So um, you have to keep your eye on that. So I'm not doing any heavy commitment on the water, but just getting some different tones here and there. Because then I can see what I can play with after it gets more on. Light in the sky. Don't be afraid to come in to touch your trees. And um, you want that interaction so you get some soft edges on that. Those things. Um, no, I've been using a, some other hog hair bristles. This is a soft brush. I'm not, I don't use a soft brush very often, but um, I learned something interesting. I just got back from 
painting out the Adirondacks with the Eric Rhodes plein air group, and it was a, a week out there, and uh, we met lots of people, and I learned a few things about brushes, and I was really struggling with getting my darks to stick on there dark enough, and I um, went down, I, I saw this guy painting, and he was, he was painting a similar scene, but I was looking at his darks, and I'm like, wow, you know, like, they were so rich and so strong, I'm like, how are you getting your dark to stay like that? And he said, well, he was using some soft brushes. And he said, don't just put a very light pressure on it so it doesn't pick up underneath, it doesn't pick up the canvas. You know, back down, just skim the surface really gently and they will stay on top of that canvas texture. And I mean, it made a huge difference. And I was like, oh my God, that's worth coming out right now. You know, that was like the first day. And it was really helpful. And so I go back, I run back to my easel, I'm looking at all my brushes, I'm like, I got one. One stupid soft brush, you know? <laughs> it was like a half inch, I'm like, shoot, I left all those at home. And, uh, but I use that one soft half inch brush a lot. <laughs> Where were you in the Adirondacks? Up in a, near Lake Placid, in a little college there, uh, Paul Smith College is where we stayed. We stayed on campus and in the dorms, um, and we went out to different places uh, each day, two places a day, and um, there's 106 artists that came, and it was just a great experience. If you ever get to do that, it's so worth it, and all experience levels. There were some people that had never painted in plein air that came. There were some people that painted very little. There was professional people who were in galleries, people you see in the magazines all the time, and have videos out. There were just all, and everybody was so nice and just helpful, friendly. Um, no teaching or instruction at all. Everybody was just there to paint together. Really, really cool. If I want to lay on paint kind of thicker, I'll definitely use my hog hair brushes and um, blocking in quickly with the hog hair because they just really push that paint around much better. A little bit of edge on the bank. I know where the reflection begins. Keep it, you know, kind of in this ab I keep it in this abstract little format for a while until I get a lot of my color notes where I want them. And, um, and then I'll go back and start getting on a little thicker layer of paint. 
since I've established enough of that. Sometimes when you get salt, once you get a lot of uh, a lot of marks on there, it's like sometimes you can feel kind of like there's just like you don't know if it's going to happen or if it's going to take place. You're going to get something together, so you finally have to just like go to one place, one little area, and start working some detail in, refining, getting a few little pieces that make something look like something. And then you feel better, you know, because otherwise it's like, ah, oh, you know, you're just kind of all over. But um, you just got to get one thing that you like, fine. Just stay with it. And then the rest, will, then you, then you have confidence the rest will happen. But, um, I think we all go through that stage of it. I mean, that's it. All these little trees in the back have already changed a lot, so I'm getting another layer of the trees in front of the dark, of the light trees in front of the dark. Doesn't look quite as flat then. Just thinking about that, that bridge. If I want to make any marks in this bridge, make it feel more like a bridge. There's so many ways of making marks. If, I, if you want to scratch them out, paint them in, use a tool. Um, but I don't want to mess around with it too much. There's so many places to go. And I'm still debating a little bit about this big old yellow grass is on my left. I want to. It's so pretty. It's a big contrast, so let's see. Okay. Sometimes you just have to compare what you have in there with and what's getting the attention you want. on your palette for color? I have cad yellow light, uh, raw sienna, cad orange, two reds like cad red light, alizarin, and a thalo red rose. I like a, a nice intense rose. Um, the oxide purple, ultramarine blue, cerulean. Sometimes I put out a turquoise. Two greens, your sap green and viridian, and two brown. Burnt sienna and burnt umber. Am I right? Sometimes black too. Big vehicle we'll have out here. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's like a car. Come on. <laughs> Just about have most of the pieces. Give a little more dimension to this back bottom edge. How did you decide on this seam? Oh, this is really hard to decide, actually. Because I had my heart set on doing something inside the the zoo area. But, you know, I really, when I'm looking for a scene, I, I'm i looking for a lot of good shapes and some good value. Uh, I want a, a good range. I want something really light and something really dark in there. And then I want some color notes. I want something that's colorful. And so in this area, there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of colorful things, except if you're going into a flower cluster. And so, um, so sometimes that makes me exaggerate some of the colors out there to get um, something a little bit more. So there's lots of things I can exaggerate in here to get more violets. I can exaggerate the colors in the, these light pieces of ground with even some white flowers or just different colors of light out there. Um, so since I am really looking for all those things, it takes me a long time to find them sometimes. I do a lot of, like I was out here last Saturday and looking all around and um, I had a hard time that day to even still know what I was going to do today. Um, and I was looking at that little waterfall over here. Because I just painted so many waterfalls at, at, at the mountains. Um, but um, this is nice to be yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, there's, painting waterfalls is, is really hard. It's a lot of focus. It's like, don't talk to me. <laughs> you tend to pick longer perspectives like this, or do you vary them between longer and one more wide angle views? I vary them. Yeah. I like to paint all kinds of things. So I really do mix mix it up. I get bored really easily. So I'm, I'm going to do something I haven't painted before. Or challenge myself. I don't know. I have one of those little um, scraper tools that Lee Radke always uses, and nobody does it better than Lee Radke. And I, I never really use it much. Look for some reflections. So how are you using that? Just to get a little line, a fine line. Cut in instead of painting it. I'll see people using really soft brushes, and um, you know, I really never use them much except for finishing. Maybe if I needed a 
softer edges, just little softer touches. But um, otherwise, I just like the hog hair generally because they really push the paint around better. Oils, at least. Go back and reinforce a little bit of light on that that bridge again. I'm keeping this light because otherwise it'd just be too gray. these colors with you know I can put them in the water too because there's so much scum that always is in the water. So you can put a lot of color in the water. By scum believe No it's <laughs> <good. Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah that too. <laughs> then it's another way to add some little accents and always junk floating in the water. Just what kind of pattern I want in this water because I'm gonna do something, something in there, but not what's exactly there because it's changing. Looks like you're using a dagger now, is that right? No, this is still a filbert. Oh, it's just worn out filbert, it's just gotten twisted and crazy. Mm -hmm. But Before we lose everybody, why don't you tell people about Main Street? Um, yeah, I own a little art school in downtown Lake Zurich. It's uh, called Main Street Art Center. And uh, we've had it for about 28 years now. And we teach classes for adults and children and um, all ages from six to 96. And uh, we have a, a staff of about um, seven other teachers and they all teach their specialties there and um, we also offer like we have about four or five um, really nice workshops with artists that come in from around the country and sometimes around the world um, and do their specialty and um, so we have some great great uh, well-known people come in and we, I try to mix up who we have come in, so I have something for everybody. Some, you know, it might be a pastel artist, might be abstract, might be um, portraits with watercolor. And we have lots of portrait and figure classes anyway. And um, uh, pastel, the great pastel people. So, um, yeah, we, we offer a lot of classes. We were closed down for a couple of months for COVID in the beginning and um, then we were able to start classes right back up because we were able to have enough spacing inside and people were masked and you know um, it, it was we were doing what we were supposed to do and so we were able to still have classes so um, we're pretty back, much back up to normal almost right now um, we have about 300 students that come through weekly and uh, through all the classes a lot of great, great people. So we feel really lucky. Yeah. yeah. Laura Robb and um, Jeff Leg and lots of, lots of good guys. We, we feel like it's the best deal in town. You know, <laughs> take a workshop at there because people can go home at night. They're not flying off somewhere to do a workshop, staying in hotels and paying the hotel fees. I mean, to get those kind of people right here close by the city right. and I know Pallet and Chisel gets great people too and um, but yeah not so many plein air oh, uh -huh. the plein air painter Chicago needs to bring them in but so I'm glad for you so yeah you get them at least once or twice a year yeah good guys 
So maybe this is all you need to see if you guys are ready to go and paint and hope you enjoy it. We're just just map, take some time mapping it out. So we'll we'll meet back at at uh, noon to do a critique today.